to um, welcome everybody to this webinar from the the CISIAC or the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center uh, to today's webinar titled Introduction to Open Source Framework, uh, the Open Source Framework, framework of Apache Camel for Data Integration and Communication. Uh, like I said, my name is Tom McGibbon and our presenter today will be Mark Webb, who I will introduce in a few minutes. But before we begin, I'm gonna, I have a few administrative comments to give everyone. Um, all the phones, except for the presenters, have been muted. Um, however, you can ask questions at any time during the presentation, and I will be monitoring those, those questions. And you can enter those questions through the Q&A pane or the chat pane in your WebEx control panel. Uh, we will address questions at the end of the presentation, uh, and we will try to answer as many as time permits. We're going to try to complete this by about 1 o'clock Eastern time. <clears throat> the most common question asked is about copies of the slides. And yes, copies of the slides will be, be available afterwards. Uh, if you would like to uh, receive a copy of the slides, please send me, Tom McGibbon, an email. My email address is on the front screen here. Uh, we're also recording this uh, presentation. And it, too, will be posted. Uh, and we will distribute a link to it once it is posted. Um, now, to begin today's presentation, let me just give a brief commercial overview about the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center. Um, you know, please note my uh, email address for any follow-up questions that you have. But the CISIAC is a specialized technical focal point and information clearinghouse for cybersecurity, information assurance, software engineering, modeling and simulation, and knowledge management for the Defense Technical Information Center. Uh, the CISIAC is operated by Quantarian Solutions Incorporated. That's who I work for. Uh, it is funded through DTIC, so funding for today's free webinar is provided in part by DTIC. Uh, please check out our website, which is at the top of the screen, or www.thecisiac.com. Um, we also have um, a couple of LinkedIn discussion groups. If, if you do a search for CISIAC software or CISIAC information assurance, you will find two discussion groups we have there. Also, our website is also a community of practice, and I would encourage you to, to join us there as well. All right. Uh, so at this point, I'd like to introduce our presenter, uh, Mark Webb, um, who has 16 years of experience in Department of Defense and Intelligence Community, software engineering, systems development, and project management. His areas of specialty include cyber weapons, system development, and multi-domain information sharing applications. Mark is a senior software engineer for SRC's um, Intelligence and Information Systems Division. In this role, he's responsible for the research, design, and development of government-sponsored advanced technology systems. Uh, so now I'll turn the presentation over to Mark. Uh, so Mark, please proceed. Okay, thanks, Tom. Um, welcome all. Uh, thanks for attending. Um, gonna go. Oh, we're running into the same problem. It looks like all the slides are being rotated. Um, you may want to okay. share. You, you want to share the PowerPoint, or is this the PowerPoint that you are sharing? Uh, this is a PDF. Can we share the PowerPoint? You can. OK. I don't see an option to do that. OK. Well, the, well let's, see, let's see how this goes then. If, you, um, if you'd like, you can share your desktop if, if, if that's preferred. OK. Um, yeah, I just would have to figure out how to get out of the current view. OK. Well, if, why don't you just continue then? This way. OK. All right, so let me start off. Uh, as Tom said, I've uh, been in the software engineering uh, field for about 16 years. Uh, most of my career has been spent working uh, Department of Defense sector, um, doing a variety of different uh, development projects, working primarily on information sharing, um, uh, you know, cyber weapons development. Uh, currently, I work for SRC, which is not for profit company. Uh, so a lot of the work I do is more in the R&D sector. So it's a lot of uh, programs that 
tend to be short duration where we're looking at getting a proof of concept or maybe a prototype out to our customer. Uh, this uh, puts me in a unique situation to where I can turn around some uh, efforts rather quickly, so I'm always on the lookout for tools that will assist me in doing that. And uh, I feel that Apache Camel is one of those that's very useful uh, to my current job. Um, just as a disclaimer, as I list here, I didn't invent uh, Apache Camel. I've been using it for about five years. Um, it's owned by the Apache uh, Software Foundation, so um, you know I really have nothing to gain here other than to uh, develop a community awareness so that maybe others uh, can share some of the experiences and, and some of the successes that I've had. Um, yeah, Tom, it looks like these are all, I don't know if maybe they're all rotated in the PDF. Um, uh, but okay, going to the next slide, uh, some of the things that I'd like to uh, cover here is how can we use this uh, tool, Apache Camel? Um, you know, how, how can it be helpful um, in your day-to-day -day development? Um, or if you're not a developer yourself, maybe uh, we can learn some things here that you can take back to your engineering group that, that may help you in either your current project or future projects. Um, again, what are some of the benefits? What is you know what does Camel offer you, and, and what doesn't Camel offer you? Um, why does it even exist? Um, I think uh, by the time we're done with this presentation, that'll be self-explanatory. Um, one area that Apache Camel uh, provides uh, that I find very useful is enterprise integration patterns, and, and I'll cover that um, in detail. Um, I guess just as a kind of a quick elevator speech on Apache Camel, it's really the plumbing of any system where you're looking at moving data around. Um, it's, it's not the fancy GUIs, it's not the fancy web pages. This, this is a component of your system that uh, essentially is going to perform all of your your plumbing, your how do you get data from point A to point B, things of that nature. Um, I'm not going to get into a lot of uh, source code. Uh, there might be a few snippets, uh, but we're not going to get into anything serious here. I want to keep this more at a higher level. Uh, I think if people wanted to get into source code, we could either take it offline, we could do a follow-up uh, presentation, but I don't want to get too far down into the bits and the bytes level in this presentation. All right, next slide. Um, so why does something like Apache Camel matter? Um, again, uh, most of your systems, uh, if you boil them right down, you're looking at, at moving data from point A to point B. Um, maybe you want to go from uh, point A to point B, back to point A. A couple examples here, um, email for instance. Um, that, that would be a scenario where you would send a message out to someone, they may reply back, um, or that message might get forwarded to others, uh, versus something like a, a, just surfing a web page. You're sending out a request to a web page, uh, the web server is processing your request and sending you a response back. Um, you know, the, while these are uh, being described as very simple um, scenarios, there, there's quite a few interactions that happen. Um, for instance, the email protocol is, uh, you know, very well defined. Uh, there's, you know, a lot of moving parts, but uh, just typing an email, hitting hitting send in, in Outlook or whatever, uh, you know, Gmail uh, makes it very simple. And tools like Camel are, are what's actually doing a lot of the heavy lifting behind the scenes. So there's a lot of different ways you can do this. You could develop your software uh, from the ground up. You can use existing frameworks. Um, you just really have to determine what works best for you. And uh, like I had said earlier, uh, a lot of the projects I work on, they tend to be quick turnarounds, uh, getting pro, uh, prototypes or proof of concepts up and running quick. So, um, you know, I have used this in some production systems as well. So it really comes down to, do you, are you looking long-term to do something right, or are you looking to just get something out the door quick? And, um, you know, you really want to uh, ask yourself what data flow looks better to you, and, and I've illustrated a couple of um, scenarios where uh, there's going to be a lot of data flow going through the lines. Um, you know, there's the spaghetti on the left, and there's 
um, you know, some racks of systems where all the, the data flow going through the uh, Ethernet lines is, is done very cleanly. Um, Apache Camel is um, a system that can get you to a point where you're going to look more like uh, the diagram depicted on the right than on the left. Um, and this is, uh, tends to be a very um, easy trap to fall into for developers when uh, you you know, you're just looking to get something up and running quick, you might fall into the category of the diagram on the left. So um, hopefully by the end of this presentation, uh, you'll have a good understanding of how to stay on the right in terms of these diagrams. Um, moving to the next slide. Um, so what is Apache Camel? It's, it's an open source integration framework. Um, again, it, it leverages, um, makes heavy use of the enterprise integration patterns approach. Um, you can um, very easily in either code or using XML configuration files, you can develop and, and uh, define your data flows. Um, there's a wide range of components that you can use, and by components I mean things like interacting with web pages or email servers or file systems and we'll go through those in depth later. Um, Camel's used by a couple different enterprise service buses that are out um, in, in uh, release now. Uh, some of them are open source. I've actually um, come across you know, some interesting scenarios where Camel's been used. Um, you know, using some open source uh, products, uh, once you, you know, start digging deep into them, you find that the camel's being used in, in quite a few of them. Um, uh, again, um, you can develop the data flows between the systems. You can also develop data flows within systems. So this, this isn't always the case where you're just looking at hooking two systems together via something like a camel. You can embed camel into your system because maybe it just makes sense for one uh, segment of your application. Um, it was uh, Apache Camel started in 2007 with its version 1.0 release, so it's been around for a while. It, it's a very robust system. Um, in terms of open source, uh, being at age six is, is pretty good. I mean, you see a lot of open source solutions out there that are you know still in their infancy, whereas Camel's been around for quite a while, and it. Um, it, it does have a pretty robust uh, following. Next slide. Um, again, it's, Camel's used, uh, there's really two major parts to it. Uh, there's the components where, again, that, that interacts with your web pages and your um, email service uh, file system, things of that nature. Then there's the enterprise, excuse me, enterprise integration patterns which is how the data is going to move around inside of CAMEL. And again, the, the enterprise integration patterns is something we'll, we'll hit upon. I have a, a few slides later on. Uh, many of the systems that are out there today uh, are machine to machine, so they don't, really, they don't require any human interaction. Uh, they tend to use standards compliant protocols where the data is very specific to the system. And, and this really um, helps out from an engineering perspective because if you're using standards-based protocols, um, it's very easy to leverage CAMEL, which understands a lot of these protocols, uh, so that tying them together or extending their functionality becomes really simple. Um, if you um, run into a situation where things aren't necessarily standards compliant or they're a complete proprietary protocol, CAMEL does have the ability to extend its functionality so that um, you can still use it. I, in a couple different systems I've used, I've had to write custom components leveraging the, the CAMEL system in order to get everything to work. And it, I found it to be very easy to use. Uh, next slide. So some facts about CAMEL, it's a top level project uh, and this is a designation that's given to mature products within the Apache Software Foundation. 
Um, it lever it's all developed using the Java programming language. There are some bindings to other languages. Uh, most of these other languages are ones that can be easily embedded into a Java virtual machine. Uh, the source code is very well organized. Um, if you ever needed to um, get into the source code of CAMEL, say you want to understand better how something works, or maybe you think you found a bug in the system, um, it's very um, organized. It, the documentation within the source code is great. Um, I actually just in, for this presentation, I ran some statistics using some software to determine uh, how many lines of code are in the, the core of CAMEL, uh, what percentage of the code is comments, and it's about 40% of the entire word, uh, I'm sorry, line count for the core of CAMEL is comments. So, um, you know, I think that lends itself very well to being a system that you can go through the source code and understand what's going on. I'm sure um, many engineers will tell you that if you start looking at open source software, uh, looking at the source code, you find that it's, it's spaghetti code. Um, it's very difficult to follow. It can be very difficult to read. Um, and for CAMEL, that just isn't the case. It's, it's, I think it's very well organized. Um, it also has a very extensive set of unit tests. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with unit tests, what unit tests allow you to do is to uh, take a specific or um, segment of the code and test that individually from um, you know the rest of the system. So you don't have to test the entire system to find out if one little uh, block of your code works. And because CAMEL is very modular, it lends itself very well to being unit tested. Um, there probably, if I were to do a count, I would bet there are probably more lines of code related to unit tests within the core of CAMEL than there are actually lines of code for the core of CAMEL. Um, and again, um, CAMEL is deployed in a lot of commercial products, a lot of government products. Um, you know, I've really been amazed at where I found CAMEL over the years. Um, I've uh, actually, I just used a system uh, not too long ago on a geospatial um, information system and I was you know I was pleasantly surprised to find that once you really boiled the system down once you got under the covers found out how the system works uh, they were using camel and a lot of their data flows in order to to move data around uh, this you know this is a system that's uh, deployed by uh, what I would consider the market leader in the geospatial arena and really, overall, it just makes sense to use. Um, it just saves you the time from, from building everything from the ground up. Uh, moving to the next slide. Uh, the community support, uh, I feel is great. Uh, you know, I've been in the mailing list uh, for CAMEL. I ran across CAMEL, I think, back in 2008. I was using it for a product. Um, so it's been around for a while. I've been... Uh, member of their mailing list, I'm not actually on the uh, list of developers for CAMEL, but I've used it for quite a while, and I can tell you that um, there's been very few instances where I've had a question, I posted it to the mailing list, and I don't get a response within a couple hours. Um, you know, you're going to find that uh, the mailing list is going to have somewhere in the range of about 100 emails a day on, on various topics, and, and that gives you a great opportunity to not only ask questions and get answers, but find out how other people are using the system so that they, um, you know, once their, their questions are answered, you can also learn from that and, um, you know, you can go back and reference that information later uh, if you ever find yourself in the same situation as, as another developer. Uh, their website um, has quite a bit of information on it. They also have a wiki that um, also has quite a bit of information, um, examples, code snippets and on how to use um, CAMEL, you know, and all, all the components that, that go along with it. Again, the source code is, is very well documented, so that's another source of, you know, if, if you're the, you know, the programmer type, you're looking at, at ways, uh, opportunities or, or avenues to find answers to your questions. Um, you can go right to the source code. Sometimes that's where I found some of mine. Uh, there's a couple books out. Uh, Camel in Action, that's been out for, I'd say, two years or so, I, I believe. There's another 
uh, book that just came out. I, actually, I just ran across this on the mailing list last week. I think it's, it's uh, fairly new. Uh, that would be the second book listed, the Instant Apache Camel Message Routing. Uh, next slide. So how would you go about deploying Camel? Uh, there's a couple different ways to do this. Again, you can um, deploy it as a standalone application. You can um, deploy it as a web application, um, if that's something that, that you're trying to develop. Um, an OSGI module, which is the Open Services Gateway Initiative. Um, typically, you would deploy Camel as an OSGI module if you were looking at deploying this on an enterprise service bus. Um, and if you're, uh, the, the fourth option I list here is if you have an existing system, for instance, and, and um, you know, you find that you're doing certain interactions with maybe other systems or just even within your current system, and, um, you know, maybe you find that, you know, after learning a little bit about CAMEL that, you know, there's easier ways to do it, you can just pull that one component out of your existing system and put CAMEL in. Um, so th those are really the four options that, that I look at as ways that you can, you can leverage this. Um, Maven uh, is a build tool uh, for Java. Uh, it's kind of, if, if you're familiar with other languages such as C or C++, you might be familiar with make files. Maven is uh, in that same vein. It, it, you know, it's what you would use to build your Java source code. It can also assist you in setting up new projects, for instance. It, it has the ability to generate um, I think the last I looked, it was about 700 various types of skeleton projects. Uh, and many of them, um, excuse me, involve CAMEL. So what you can use is, uh, or what you can do is you can use CAMEL to develop these skeleton projects, which um, head you in the right direction for um, developing either the standalone CAMEL application or maybe an OSGI module, some of the uh, examples I listed above. Um, so in CAMEL, there's the concept of routes, and I'll, I'll get into more of this later, but routes are how you would um, receive data, how you would process data, and how you would output data to a variety of sources. And some of the different ways those can be defined are in XML files. Uh, you can define these routes right in your Java source code. Um, different domain-specific languages, Scala being one of them. Um, Scale is a programming language that can be embedded into a Java virtual machine, so you can define your routes in Scala. Um, you can also do Blueprint XML. Uh, Blueprint XML is what um, feeds into uh, the OSGI module. So you can actually develop an OSGI module that's really nothing more than an XML file. Um, and, and you can deploy that in your enterprise service bus and you would have uh, your camel functionality. Um, some other things you can do is uh, remote management. This tends uh, to be a big item in, in a lot of the different systems I've worked on. Remote management allows you to, from typically a thin client, such as a browser, get a view into how your system is running. Uh, and Camel, by default, utilizes the Java management extensions. I'll, I'll touch upon those a little bit later, uh, but that's um, available out of the box using CAMEL. Um, it also has the ability to do failover, load balancing, throttling, things of that nature, which are very important in enterprise systems. Next slide. Um, again, so how can it help you? Um, in addition to what I've already covered, um, one nice thing about CAMEL is its modularity, so you can build custom components um, and you can take those components and just rewire them in maybe a different order. So maybe you're, you have three CAMEL components that you've developed. Uh, we can, we'll call them A, B, and C. Well, maybe you find that you want to put C in front of B. That really just comes down to modifying the definition for your route. You don't have to change any of the source code for those components. You just have to put them in a different order. Uh, the components, again, components are, are primarily used for getting data in and out. Um, it's, it's the part of CAMEL that speaks externally, um, but there's also the enterprise inter integration pattern. Um, 
extension that the CAMEL provides that, that moves the data around inside. Um, payload agnostic routing, I found that this is really important and this is, you know, is really um, desirable from a, a customer perspective because every customer is going to have a different set of data requirements and you can develop your system in it's really independent of what the data is. I mean, you're obviously, you're going to build custom components that process a certain type of data, but Camel doesn't really care what that data looks like. It places it into an envelope um, and just moves it around from point to point. And it's, it's the developer's job to figure out how to process that data. So there isn't a specific Camel for, we'll say, um, web content and a separate camel for email. Um, camel is camel and that data is independent. Um, just makes for easy uh, development and, and integration when you don't have to worry so much about um, you know, having custom instances of camel for each different type of data set. Uh, next slide. I get caught up and rotated here. Uh, okay, so I've been talking long enough about these components. So here's an example of uh, some of the components. Currently, there's over 120 of them that Camel provides. A couple, uh, you know, I'll just hit upon these quickly. Cache, that's um, like an in-memory storage container analogous to a database, um, but it, it's more of like a key value uh, type of store. Um, CXF, that's uh, web services, that's actually, CXF is an Apache product uh, that, that supports web services and, and that integrates into CAMEL as well. Um, exec uh, allows you to execute a command within CAMEL, file, um, it'll allow, um, the, the component allows you to read files from, um, from disk, write them out to disk, um, FTP, uh, secure FTP, um, some of the other ones, Gmail. So you have the ability to write some routes inside of Camel um, that can read uh, your Gmail, for instance, or if you want to send email uh, using your Gmail account, you have the ability to do that. Um, some other ones, I IRC, uh, again, you can have um, um, I IRC, uh, you can read from it, you can write to it. So you can actually write almost, you know, like back in the days where you had IRC bots, you can write IRC bots using CAMEL um, where it'll interface to the IRC. So you don't, so the nice thing uh, with what these components will provide is you don't have to worry about what the IRC protocol is. That's the component's job. That's already been done for you. So you can hook into that component, talk to an IRC channel, um, or you know some of the other ones that I'm listing here. Um, Hazelcast, that's a data grid that's written completely in Java. Uh, Lucene is a text indexing and, and search capability. Again, that's another Apache product. Um, you know, just going down through the list, you see SSH. If you uh, need to secure shell in uh, to a machine, maybe you want to copy files to it. Maybe you want to copy from it. Uh, run some commands over SSH, you have that ability in CAMEL. Um, RSS, um, that seems to be more and more prevalent uh, across the internet. There's also some uh, social components for CAMEL. Uh, you can interact with Facebook, you can interact with Twitter, um, you know, some other ones, Orkut, Foursquare. Uh, getting back to the whole enterprise spin on this, um, you can interact with uh, Hadoop, for instance. So you could read and write to a um, HDFS. Um, you know, if you're you're either gathering data or you want to write data out, maybe you have some MapReduce. Um, you know, jobs that you want to run, you can do that using um, you know the HDFS component. So you can you write the data and then you can kick off a MapReduce job, for instance. So um, again, the components hide a lot of the underlying protocol information. So like I said, um, 
you know, just going back to the IRC, for instance, you don't have to worry about what IRC looks like um, on the wire. You just make the calls to the CAMEL component, um, and it'll it'll talk to the IRC server. Um, so next slide, I'm just going to go through a couple simple examples here, just to kind of give you an idea of what what this all looks like. Um, the first one here, say we want to. Um, just wire up something simple that would take a file off of disk and send it to both your Twitter and your Facebook feed. So you could drop a file in, maybe that file, you know, contains, um, you know, whatever, you know, some kind of, you know, message you just want to post to both of these. Uh, you can do so using this simple um, Java DSL in, in the upper gray box. Um, I'm hiding out a lot of the details concerning authentication. Obviously, you can't just post to your Twitter feed without knowing what your username and password is. Um, these use a um, authorization scheme uh, that's be, you know, it's becoming more and more common across the internet. And therefore, um, you can use a, a, a OAuth is, is the name, but you can um, you know, configure these endpoints or these components to use Twitter and Facebook uh, leveraging the OAuth. Uh, some others here, you have like a simple TCP proxy. You just want to read in from one port and send data out to another. Okay, um, you know, you can drop a file into a directory and have it logged. Um, and you can see how the other ones work. Uh, email files, you can drop a file in a directory, send it to your Gmail account. Uh, next slide, I have a couple more. Uh, setting up a web server, for instance, you can use the Jetty component, which Jetty is an embeddable uh, Java-based web server, uh, I guess more specifically an application server. And in just a couple lines of Java code, using Camel, you can set up a Jetty web server that listens on a specific URL. If you were to go to that URL, uh, you could um, get back the word hello. Or you, you know, obviously you could extend this to do a lot more functionality than just printing out hello. Uh, there's also a weather component. Uh, in a couple lines of code, you can uh, get the weather. Um, something like this weather component, for instance, you could put on a timer and and say every day at eight o'clock in the morning, you want to send yourself an email that um, tells you what the daily forecast is. It's something that's very simple to do in Camel, uh, actually with just a couple lines of code. Uh, next slide. Uh, security. So this, this is another big item. Um, how do you secure your Camel deployment? There's a couple of different ways to do it. Um, you have again, you have your configuration files. Um, Camel provides the ability to encrypt your configuration files um, so that just anybody can look and see. Uh, for instance, if uh, again going back to a Gmail component, for instance. You want to, you're going to need to put your username and password um, into the configuration so that you can connect to your account if you want to send or receive um, email. Uh, you want to secure that, obviously, so the whole world can't see what your password is. Camel provides that ability. Uh, endpoint security, this is another important. Uh, a lot of the components support either authentication or secure socket layer. Um, those are built in. That's really just a configuration uh, item where you say you want to use SSL. You can specify your, your public key, your private key, all that information. There's also payload security and route security. Um, payload uh, allows you to do, um, primarily if you want to convert your data to XML as it's going from point to point within CAMEL, you have the ability to use um, XML digital signature, um, you can also encrypt uh, the entire message or maybe just part of a message. Route security allows you to do role-based authorization, um, cryptography, session management, all within your routes. Uh, next slide. Uh, performance. Uh, this is obviously a big item. Um, how well does this all perform? I mean, this all sounds great, but at the end of the day, if, if it goes pretty slow, then most people are not going to want to use it. Um, it has the ability to stream data. While most of CAMEL is, is more of a store and forward type of paradigm, you can stream data through it um, in order to try to get a little better performance. Um, 
being that it's Java, threading um, is something that's very easy to wire into your system. Um, going back to the components, you can assign X number of threads to each component. You, this isn't going to be just a single threaded uh, portion of your system. This, uh, by um, threading the individual components or maybe the entire system, what you can do is you can place pieces of your code into lightweight processes in order to have some of this uh, execution happen in parallel. This allows you to um, leverage, maybe if you have a multi-core or multi-processor machine, uh, this will increase your performance. Things like load balancing, uh, there's seven different policies that come out of the box from Camel, and I have them listed there. Um, you also have the ability to extend uh, the um, current um, architecture in Camel, so if you want to create your own load balancing, um, you know, if, if you want to, um, you know, maybe come up with some new um, idea, a new way in which to load balance, you have that ability. You're not stuck with just what Camel provides. Um, failover, that essentially just uses the load balancing mechanisms listed above. If one fails, it's just going to roll to the next one. Um, and I put this, um, the, the bottom link in, um, some of this information is based off of uh, a PhD thesis paper written by Matthew Welch, uh, where it has the whole idea of event-driven. So um, as you're going from point to point within CAMEL, you have this uh, one, one thing, you know, uh, component B is not going to execute until A is complete, you know, but A is going to trigger B and say, okay, now it's your turn to go ahead and execute. Um, a lot, some of the core components from CAMEL are listed in this PhD paper. I, I found that it's very interesting. It's something, um, you know, if you got a few minutes, I'd go back and take a look at. Uh, management uh, is the next item. Uh, there's a couple different systems. Uh, they're independent from the CAMEL project that show you, that allow you to manage your system. Um, there's really a fourth, uh, but it's the fourth would be the Java management extensions that's built into the current um, JDK distribution. Um, so, so you really get that for free. Um, so I would call that a fourth, but really there's only three of them that are separate from the, the Java Development Kit and from CAMEL. Uh, they're all, uh, the three that I'm going to discuss are web-based. Uh, JMX, uh, Java Management Extensions, is not web-based, uh, but it could be web-based, and, and I'll explain how. Um, Hot IO, this is more of a uh, general purpose administration tool. In my experience, it's, it's the best one of them all. It, it has the most bells, bells and whistles. So this is really like the Cadillac of the administration for CAMEL. Um, it uses HTML5. It's all written in Java so that it's easily embedded into a variety of application servers. Um, and it uh, features quite a few plugins to allow you to manage not only CAMEL, but uh, things like a, uh, ActiveMQ, which is a messaging service, um, other application servers like Tomcat or Jetty, as well as um, Apache's open enterprise service bus. Uh, a couple others, J JBoss RHQ and CamelWatch. RHQ is a specific um, administration tool for JBoss deployments, uh, which is uh, another area that the Camel is very heavily used in. Uh, CamelWatch is basically uh, a REST uh, wrapper around the Java management extensions that I mentioned before that come directly from uh, the Java development kit. Uh, next slide. Uh, I'm going to talk about enterprise integration patterns. I'm just going to go right on the slide uh, 21. And I'll go through these kind of quick. Um, for the enter enterprise integration patterns, um, patterns have been, been around for quite a while. Um, you know, patterns are something that comes off of the Gang of Four Designs book uh, that I'm sure just about any engineer who's worked in the last 10 or 15 years have seen. Uh, they're community-driven rules. Um, they've grow, um, they initially were defined or, or uh, described in order to connect enterprise systems. Nowadays, they've grown into connecting just about anything. 
um, within a software process. And CAMEL does um, make heavy use of the enterprise integration patterns. I've provided a link where you can get more information. Um, what I like mostly about this is, is because there's such a common theme here, um, what you can do, um, as you see in the bottom, you, you can get stencils for Microsoft Visio, for instance, and you can define your entire data flow using the enterprise integration patterns uh, stencils. You can define all this in Visio and then um, go back, hand this to, a, to an engineer, and it becomes a pretty uh, simple process to just wire all this up uh, in either Java or XML. Uh, next slide. Um, there are four main areas. Um, file transfer, again, this is uh, would be like web traffic, maybe file transfer protocol, uh, shared databases are for things like X, uh, SQL, uh, the NoSQL, which is a big movement nowadays with um, things like HBase and um, Mongo. Uh, they're also in-memory databases would fall into this category. Uh, remote invocation, not quite as heavily used as the other three. Uh, in my opinion, I think messaging is probably used the most. Uh, next slide. Um, some of the different terms and concepts here. Channels, these are virtual connections. Uh, and the reason I say they're virtual is because they can ride over TCP, they can ride over UDP, um, and maybe it's, it's something as simple as interacting with the file system. So um, it's much easier to just refer to them as a virtual connection versus like your, your typical connections, whether they be TCP, uh, UDP, things of that nature. Messages, um, these are really just your packets of data that's going over that virtual connection. Uh, Multi-delivery, uh, this is analogous to uh, like an email, for instance, where maybe you're sending an email to um, you know, two or three, five, ten different people. Um, they will be classified as multi-delivery. Uh, routing, that's how you're going to get your information from point A to point B. So somewhere uh, in the course of sending an email, uh, there has to be some routing that happens. So um, while these are described in here, they're not really new concepts. They're just ways to generalize the data and, and to have it better understood uh, by the developers. Um, again, routing, um, obviously that has to happen at some point in order to get an email from point A to point B. Transformation is um, if you want to, um, you know, your data is going to be converted, um, you know, from one format to another. Uh, some of the different ways uh, you can channel your information. Uh, you might want to go one to one, one to many. Uh, maybe you just want to send it and you don't even care about getting a response back. That, that falls under uh, something like a UDP. Um, guaranteed delivery, that, uh, again, that's something that's important. Um, I'll cover that a little bit more later. Um, message construction. This um, this we can go through kind of quick, but a uh, couple different things here. So you have message intent, um, which is really just a command message. Uh, if you want to send some data out and tell somebody that they need to do something with it, you might want to send out a command message ahead of time to inform them that, that this is going to um, need to occur. Event notification, uh, that's where uh, you might have external entity or entities which have registered uh, to get um, an update or a notification when a specific event has happened. Uh, request response, uh, that's if you're sending a, a message and then wanting to get a message back. Um, next slide, and this is, this is probably, in my opinion, most important are the enterprise integration patterns. There's different ways to route messages or filter messages. Um, again, routing, uh, the analogy there would be like uh, if you're sending out emails, for instance. Filters, if you want to uh, filter a message for a certain entity. Maybe, for instance, you're receiving data and you only want data that has a specific flag in that. Uh, you could set up a filter to do so. Uh, splitter, this, um, this would be in the case of uh, say, for instance, you're, you're passing somebody a zip file, for instance, and you want to decompose that. You want to split that message into uh, smaller parts, whether it be logically. You can also split a, a message just to, if it's a very large message. Say you're, you received a 10-megabyte message. 
you want to break it into 10 one megabyte chunks for easier processing. You have the ability to do that. Um, aggregator is um, would be the opposite of a splitter. A lot of times when you're defining this information, um, you, anytime you have a splitter, you're going to want to have an aggregator as well. Um, routing slip, that allows you to um, say, here's where I want this message to go. Maybe you have a couple different endpoints um, and you can specify those ahead of time or you can spe specify them um, uh, dynamically while the system's up and running. Uh, recipient list, that's very similar to a routing slip, um, but it, you can use it to do com content based routing, and, and I'll go into some more information on that uh, here in a minute. Um, I'll just show this quick. This I actually pulled from uh, the link you see at the bottom. Um, it kind of walks you through um, just, you know, if you're interested in, in figuring out which um, which one of these routers is best suited for what you need, uh, this kind of walks you through how to do it. Um, transformation, uh, just uh, you can see here, there's different ways you can either normalize the data if it's coming in and it's not all the same type. Um, this one tends to be used quite a bit um, if you're pulling data from multiple sources and you want to get everything to one format. Uh, something like a normalizer would allow you to do that. Uh, messaging endpoints, th these are primarily um, on the input side. You have the ability to pull a um, external system for information. Maybe you want to do a database query every five minutes to find out exactly uh, what is in that database or maybe any new records that might be in that database. You, you can only query for, um, you know, the data that's been in there in the last five minutes. You can gather that data versus gathering everything and process that information. Uh, selective consumers, that's if you want to filter the data that's coming in. So again, we can take that database analogy, for instance, and, and maybe you only want to do a query and get certain information, or data is coming to you and you only want to process data that, that is a certain format, for instance, uh, you can do that uh, using a con, uh, I'm sorry, um, using the selective consumer. Um, next slide. Uh, these are more system, uh, again, as it says here, uh, they don't really help the outcome of your application, but they can enhance it. Um, detour, for instance, if you want to do logging, you uh, might just want to split off your data flow so that you can log the information. Or maybe in the course of engineering you find some bug, you're not exactly sure what's causing it. You can put a detour in, you can inspect the data um, and not affect the, the primary flow of information. Uh, wiretap uh, does much of the same thing, but it's uh, where there's a detour, you can end up back into the main flow where there's a wiretap. You're just, um, uh, you know, just as it says, you're just tapping into that data flow and inspecting the data. Message store, if you want to put information into any kind of storage, whether it be database, uh, file system, uh, in-memory database, uh, things of that nature, uh, that's what the message store can do. And the control bus, that's primarily used for management and monitoring. Uh, next slide, I'm going to have show you some examples, so I'm going to jump right ahead to slide 32. I think we're getting a little short on time. Um, so file movement based on content. So this is bringing everything full circle. So we have a polling consumer. So this is uh, where it's depicted as the enterprise integration pattern uh, polling consumer component. This is something that comes with CAMEL. Um, so you see you have your source folder, you're going to be looking at that directory maybe every second, 10 seconds, however you have it set up. Anything that it finds in that folder, it's going to read in, um, grab the contents of that message, pass it to the, to the router, and in this case, um, these files we would be dropping in are XML. We can use something called XPath for those not familiar, is, is something that, that can navigate or search through an XML document. And based on the XPath 
uh, coupled with the content-based router, you would place that uh, XML file in either directory A or directory B. Um, the cool thing about all this is you can do, um, you can perform all this uh, using one simple camel route. You can define it all in an XML configuration file. You don't even have to write any Java code to do it. Um, you know, that, that's kind of the nice thing about this is, is you can perform some of these uh, activities without even having any knowledge of, of Java or any other programming language. Uh, the next one, uh, slide 33. Uh, this I thought was interesting because I actually did this, um, I think, two years ago. So my wife was telling me, you know, it's getting close to Christmas time. See if you can find a deal online. Well, there's a hundred different sites that you can go to to find deals on Dell Notebooks, for instance. So what I did is I actually set up a camel uh, route that would pull a bunch of different websites, grabbing the RSS, the real simple syndication file, which is really just an XML file that will list to you all the um, updates made to that site. So I, I pulled all those every hour and I uh, put them all into an aggregator in, inside a camel and then I used a keyword search for Dell Notebook and any of the results I would send to myself. So what we really have here is on the far left, we, we're using an RSS component inside a camel to gather all the RSS feeds into a aggregator, um, which is an enterprise uh, integration pattern that, that's bundled with camel. Um, I set up a keyword filter and if it, if any of the uh, matches um, you know, hit the criteria that I'm looking for, then I would send myself a Gmail and I actually CC'd my wife on it so she could look and, and see what kind of deals are out there. Uh, the cool thing about this is, as I, I was able to define all this in five lines of Java code. Um, I could um, add in new RSS feeds and it only required one more line of code. So really this is something that I could put together in maybe a half an hour. Um, now, if you were to go and write this from scratch, it's obviously going to take you a lot longer. Um, I don't have to worry about the RSS um, code anymore. I don't have to worry about how to interface with Gmail. Um, I'm just going to leverage the components that are there in Camel. Um, so I'll go to my next example. Um, this is something um, I actually found online. Um, I kind of um, actually had a task I was working on a while back where I was um, looking at, at all the flights that were currently over the U.S. And I thought to myself, okay, I can pull the information. Uh, now I'm looking at the diagram reading left to right. I can pull the information off of uh, a website, and that's going to give me a, a list of every flight and information about it, where it took off from, where it's going to land, what time it took off, what its current elevation, what type of plane, uh, what, what carrier it is, and I can split that all up into separate records. Uh, once I've done that, there might be some flights that are over the U.S. that originated or are destined for non-U.S. airports. So I filtered those out. I then did a content enrichment where I uh, got the, look, the current lat long of that flight. I went out to a website online that would allow me to um, get the current weather for a lat long, I added it to the message, and then I routed the flight information based on is that flight in a good weather area or a bad weather area. And if it was bad, I could then, um, you know, I could email it out, I could, um, you know, do a variety of different things. And, and again, with Camel, you can you can email it out. You could drop that message into a folder. Um, I even, uh, at one point, I was leveraging some of the Amazon functionality that allowed me to send myself an SMS. Um, really, the sky's the limit on, on different um, integrations. Uh, next slide. Um, what I'm going to show here is these are a couple alternatives. Um, I, I feel that if, if I'm going to talk highly about Camel, I should also tell you who its uh, kind of competitors are. Um, Beeple is, is uh, one alternative. Uh, the, 
The biggest problem I find with Beeple is it's really web service based, which as you've seen with Camel, you can um, leverage a lot of the other components inside of Camel that aren't web service based. So um, I think that you know if you're going to stick in the web service arena, then the Beeple might work, but I um, would rather give myself more flexibility. Uh, because you never know when your boss is going to come in your office one day and say, well, we don't want to do web services anymore. We want to do something else. So, um, and I think my boss is listening. So, um, you know, that's why I'd rather use Camel than, than something that might back me into a corner early on in a development effort. Um, Spring integration, in my opinion, is probably closest to Camel. Uh, JBoss Drools, that's more of a rules-based engine. Uh, kind of has a different use than what Camel is designed for. You can get Drools and Camel to do what the other one does, but I tend to, you know, if Drools does one thing well, let it do that and, and not try to, you know, cram a square peg in a round hole. And business process management, um, some would argue it's in a completely different space than Camel. Um, they're related, uh, but I don't really, um, think they're, they're necessarily operating in the same space, but they are related nonetheless. Um, let's see, I think this is my last slide. Uh, final thoughts. Um, hopefully I, I got across the point that Camel has a robust set of components to it, um, that it, it will enable the developer to connect a wide range of systems. Um, give you, I also hope you, you got a little insight into the whole concept of enterprise integration patterns and how they might help you um, as a developer or a designer or an architect. Um, and also the, the ability to extend current um, CAMEL functionality. Um, you know, so if, you, if there is a need um, and you don't see that it exists in CAMEL, you have the ability to extend it. Um, and Things like security, administration, uh, performance, like load balancing and failover are integrated in CAMEL as well. Um, and uh, last slide, um, any of the source code that you might like to see and some of the, the simple examples that I did later on or even some of the snippets that I did early on, um, those are available for download if anybody's interested. You can either contact uh, Tom McGibbon or myself, and there's my email address. Um, so that's that's all I have. Okay. Well, well, thank you, Mark, very much. Um, very excellent um, presentation. Uh, I, I only have a couple of minor questions, but before I do that, we do uh, wanted to get a little bit of feedback from the attendees on our presentation presentation today. So if I could have John post the poll, we have like three questions we, we would like to ask. Uh, and while you're answering those questions, um, I'll ask just a couple of uh, small questions for you, Mark. Um, uh, one of the attendees wanted to know why it was being why it's called Camel. That is a good question. I don't have a good answer for you. Okay. Um, you know, as long as as I've been um, using Camel, I've often had that thought in the back of my mind, but I never really got a good answer on it. I know um, I know some of the developers can call themselves camel riders, um, but yeah, I, honestly, I never really okay. knew the answer to that. Right. It, it, it's just one of those cute things that the sure. world has come up with, right? Um, sure. The, the only other question is whether or not you can do Perl binding with this. Uh, are you able to? Uh... I believe... Um, I've never done this myself, but I know there are bindings uh, to Java uh, with Perl. Um, so I think if you were to extend some of the functionality in Camel and, and brought in those those Java to Perl bindings, I believe it's it's possible. I don't believe Camel does direct uh, bindings to Perl. I think you'd have to uh, take an intermediate step and uh, do the Camel. I'm sorry, the Java to Perl binding. And then take that and integrate it into Camel. I see. So it, okay. it'd be like a, a two-step process. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, the final question I have is, you know, you talk about performance. I mean, in your experience, the performance has been excellent in 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 real systems and and things of that sort. Yeah, I think it's it's important to you know keep that in the back of your mind because even a system like Camel, um, you know, it. it 
it's more of a framework, so it, it's going to run as fast as the software that you integrate into it. Um, I think it does a very good job on its own. So if, if you integrate software that, that performs really well, uh, then the system's going to perform really well. But um, if you have some components that, that do operate very slowly, integrating them into CAMEL isn't going to speed them up. You, you know, you can do a few things like uh, the load balancing, or you could add more threads uh, to try to um, make better utilization of the processor or processors or, or cores. Um, but that's really about all, the best you can do. Okay. Um, it's, okay. You know, CAMEL is not going to take a slow process and speed it up automatically for you. So there are a few things you can do, but ideally you're going to want to speed up uh, or try to find some improvements in your in your code prior to inclusion into a CAMEL framework. I see. Um, a couple more questions have come in. Uh, how okay. about the, how about the visual route builder tools? Are they worthwhile? Um, I've used a couple. Um, most of them are in more in the commercial space. Uh, the the hot IO that that I showed does have uh, the ability, or it's going to in the very near future, uh, support uh, graphical building of uh, components. But um, I haven't really used any that have done a great job. I've used a couple that have done a good job. Um, one other thing, um, one other point I guess I could uh, suggest is CAMEL does have the ability to uh, take its current route or routes that you've defined and output them as an image file, which will give you a, a better understanding of exactly what CAMEL thinks those routes look like. So that way, if you define all your routes in whether it be Java code or XML code, and then you want to run a command, um, and this is uh, leverages some of the Maven build tools, uh, you can output that to to your your JPEG image file, so you can get a good idea of what it looks like. And maybe if you spec everything out in video, for instance, and then you look at the JPEG resultant file, you can compare the two and see how close you are. So that's that's kind of another way to to go about things. Um, but I guess getting back to the original question, there are build tools out there that, that allow you to do this graphically. Most of them do exist in the commercial space. I see. Okay. Um, one final question, because we've run out of time, is uh, when should I give up Camel for a true ESB-like mule? Um, I mean, that's that's a good question. ESBs, uh, like I said early on, um, Camel is, in my opinion, kind of like a lightweight enterprise service bus. I think if you need more of the robustness, more of the um, really kind of end-to-end, -end, you know, full cycle development and deployment, um, you know, something like a mule is, is definitely the way to go. I mean, it, it does have more bells and whistles than Camel does. Um, it, you know, it, it really depends on your use case and, and what your requirements are. but. Sure. I found in, in many of the systems that I've built, I found that I don't necessarily need an ESB. I mean, I've used ESBs before, and I, I'm a big fan of them, um, but I think it really just comes down to requirements. I think if, if you find that your requirement set is, is very rich, very robust, and um, you need some of the extra functionality that Camel doesn't provide that something like a Mule or a Service Mix does, then that's the route you're going to want to go. The nice thing about this is, um, more so with something like a service mix versus Mule is that you could take all the code you've developed up until that point where you decide you want to switch gears and you can integrate it into an enterprise service bus with very little code modification. Because Camel does integrate into some of these enterprise service buses, um, it's going to be supported out of the box and um, it allows you to make that decision uh, much easier because of the fact that you, you're not going to have to go and rewrite all of your code to migrate into a, an enterprise service bus. Okay. Very good. Well, um, it's about five after, I think, so I think it's time that we close up here. And uh, Again, I'd like to thank Mark very much for uh, this excellent presentation, and um, I, I hope to see everybody back for at our 
next webinar uh, probably sometime in October. So thank you, Mark. Thank you. Okay. Bye, everybody.